You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And uh, today we have uh, something we haven't done really all of 2022 because uh, our schedules just got so messed up. But uh, it's it's something that we try to do for you at least uh, once a quarter because, uh, well, you ask us all the time. What is the park doing? What is the park doing? I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't work for the park. But I do have somebody on who does work for the park. You know him. You love him. Um, you, you know him as the uh, chief of interpretation here at uh, Gettysburg National Military Park. But we just call him friend. And it's uh, Chris Gwynn. Hello, Chris. How are Hello, you? friend. Good to see you. <laughs> How you doing, I'm pal? good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Oh, oh thank you for coming on. Uh, this is very helpful to... Uh, you know, all the Gettys nerds out there to, to have this on and uh, there's something for them to look forward to in the winter months of 2023. Ugh, I, I, I shudder to think of winter, but uh, that's just me. But so we we uh, we always look forward to the winter lectures. Yes. yes. And um, let's start with since that's the, the big one. Uh, let's start with that. I, I'm going through the list here. You sent it to me uh, earlier. And I'm going through it, and I notice, oh, let's see, one, two, seven, two, seven, two, seven, yeah, of all these people, not one of them is me. I guess my invitation got lost in the mail. We're, we're <laughs> you know, you're, you're such a valuable asset. Right. We really need to be, right. we need to think very critically about how right. to utilize right. your particular brand of sure. skills. Sure, And yeah, no, we got I, you queued up, I'm sure, for the, the 160th. Oh, 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 there you go. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that this year? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. The 160th of 161st another battle. will be just as big, I'm sure. <laughs> sure it will, of course. No, of course, Chris, uh, you know, I tease you because I, I understand that I'm not at that level yet, but uh, someday, someday well, I will. You know, I think that you are at the top of your particular game. And so I'm very uh, appreciative that you uh, provide us this platform. So thank oh, you. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So winter lectures. Yes, Got sir. a lot of interesting people and topics coming up this year. Um, go into, let's look, uh, well, here, you know what I'll do? I'll read, uh, I'll read them off and you, uh, you know, throw in any kind of information yeah, that absolutely. you want. All right. So January 7th, that's a Saturday. We have intelligence gathering at Culp's Hill by Troy Harmon. Um, yeah. what's he going to go into on this one here? Well, Troy's going to look at the Southern tactical strategy surrounding uh, the assault on Culp's Hill. So what did they know? What prompted their decisions? Uh, the ebb and flow of battle on July 2nd and July 3rd. What, you know, what did Ewell know? What did Johnson know? And so particularly for those um, aficionados of the battle who've been on Troy's battle walks, this is going to be a great opportunity to dig a little bit deeper into that material. So he's, uh, he's kicking us off on January the 7th at 1.30 in the Museum and Visitor Center. As always, it is free, free and open to the public. Just grab that ticket day off. Free. All right. And then the next day, Sunday, January 8th, George Dewey and the American Civil War. Uh, it's by Carlton Smith. Carlton Smith. What's this going to go into? You know, he's, uh, Carlton is, um, is, uh, he's got a lot of experience uh, with examining the United States and the Confederate States Navy at the mm. time of the American Civil War. So yeah. he's going to be looking at George Dewey, uh, his, his role during the American Civil War, and how um, that kind of sets the trajectory of his naval career in mm -hmm. the post-war period. So that'll be on Sunday, that first weekend. Didn't he do uh, something on Farragut last year? He did on um, Franklin Buchanan Oh, Buchanan. Year. He has done Farragut before, so okay. this is kind of a continuation of that series. Okay, got it, got it. Um, and then uh, Saturday, the 14th of January, John Hunt Morgan, Thunderbolt of the Confederacy, by our buddy Matt Atkinson. Uh, Matt Matt loves uh, loves these uh, colorful characters, doesn't he? I think it... it um, it aligns with Matt's uh, Matt's personality. <laughs> it certainly so, does. You know, I'm sure it, it we'll have a big crowd for that. The, the story of John Hunt Morgan is a fascinating one. If you don't yep. know about, it. I won't go into details. So I don't want to give it away. Right. But they, it involves a raid into Ohio, a prison break. He's a fascinating individual, and I'm sure Matt, as he always does, will bring that to life. Uh, Sunday, the 15th. By the way, folks, in case you haven't picked it up yet, they're Saturday and Sunday. It's not they just are. one day of the weekend. It's both days of the weekend, correct. and it's two different ones every week, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. Uh, all right, the 15th. If these things could talk, I love these, uh, with Tom Holbrook. These are artifacts from the collection of Gettysburg National Military Park. Yes, yeah, so these are special. And we don't do these regularly. This is, you know, a once in a winter type of thing where Tom works with our, our curator. And we, we highlight certain objects that we have in our collection that are not on display. And what Tom does is then he gives the context mm -hmm. to those objects. So what is this? What does it tell us about the American Civil War? What personalities might it be associated with? 
and it, I, you know, I think they're one of the best programs we give. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. Uh, let's see. Then moving on to the twenty first Saturday, Little Round Top, the Vision Place of Souls by, by yours me, truly, yeah. you or ours truly, you. Yes, Chris Quinn. So, what are you going to get into there? So you you uh, you may. Or by may the not way, this heard. is a real tease. <laughs> when when Little Round Top is closed, getting well, yeah. people all. <laughs> That's the exact point. So okay. that's the point. All right, all right. So Little Round Top. Yeah. Uh, what I want to do is is delve into the story of Little Round Top with it, you know certainly a focus on the battle. Yeah. But also how how was Little Round Top remembered by the individuals who fought there? Right, the veterans. How what kind of landscape, commemorative landscape, did they craft on the hill? What did they remember about the battle? What did they disagree uh, with about with the, you know their comrades who experienced the same thing? We're going to talk about, you know, Governor Warren, uh, Joshua Chamberlain, of course, Strong Vincent, the first memorials and monuments on the Hill. And, I, you know, hopefully gain a little bit of insight into, you know, why is Little Round Top so famous? Why do we care about it so much? Yeah. And in turn, why are we spending 24 months and millions of dollars to rehabilitate it? Right. So why are people drawn to that place? Great, great question. And I hope you have an answer for us. I will. I, you know, <laughs> I... I'll, I'll provoke maybe questions that uh, we can ponder collectively. And we'll figure out the yeah, answers We'll figure ourselves. it out. Uh, Sunday uh, 22nd, the Great Reunion of 1913, John Heiser coming back. So uh, aficionados of Gettysburg may recall John Heiser, the famed legendary historian, mm -hmm. uh, librarian at Gettysburg National Military Park. We've called him out of retirement nice. to be part of our, our lecture series, and he graciously uh, accepted. That's great. Uh, the 22nd, Saturday, I'm sorry, 28th, Saturday, uh, from 2nd Manassas to Gettysburg, the true story of a Texas brigade officer and a Union artillerist by Wayne Motts from the Gettysburg Foundation. Yeah, so Wayne, as uh, I'm sure everyone knows, is president of the Gettysburg Foundation, and you know, he is a, a tremendous licensed battlefield guide and historian in his own right. Yeah. And we're so thrilled that he's uh, donated some of his time to, uh, to delve into this topic with us. So it's a fascinating story, very much grounded in, a, in kind of a human interest perspective. So this is the story of two individuals who kind of collide on the battlefield. Mm. And so I'm very excited about it. All right. Uh, Sunday the 29th, from the Iron Brigade to Chief Joseph, John Gibbon's military career yeah. by Carlton Smith. Again, that's interesting. So this is going to follow John Gibbon mm -hmm. from his experience as, you know, the original commander of the Iron Brigade, you know, wounded at Gettysburg, tremendous military career. Carlton's going to follow him out west to the frontier to the uh, campaigns against the Nez Pierce. So I'm nice. very excited about that one as well. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Getting into February, <clears throat> Saturday the 4th, reading between the lines, soldier accounts from the battle or from the Gettysburg battle by Troy Harmon again. Um, what's this about? This is uh, going to be super cool. So Troy's looking at letters, diaries from soldiers that are written in the immediate aftermath of the battle. Mm -hmm. What are they saying? How did they process their experience at Gettysburg? And how, how did they think about what they went through? What did they think the Gettysburg battle meant? Was it a victory? Was it a defeat? You know, how are they, in the immediate aftermath of the battle, how are they thinking about what they went through? So Troy's going to delve into that. It's primary source material. You're going to hear from the soldiers themselves. That's going to be cool. I think so. I think it's going to be very good. I like Troy's uh, talks and, and walks because they're he, his perspective. He comes at it from a different perspective a lot, and I, I think does. it's interesting. It's he, a he, food for thought. He he you know applies a very very um different lens to how we we look at the battle, which yeah. I think you know, especially for folks that have studied the battle a lot, it's, it's you know it's. it's brings a lot of value to the experience. Sure. Uh, February 5th, Sunday, what the ground lay bare, archaeology at Little Round Top and Devil's Den by Eric, oh, how do you pronounce that, Kroish? Eric Kroish. Kroish. He is the park archaeologist. Okay. And so a big part of the Little Round Top rehabilitation, where you're disturbing the, the landscape, is, is conducting archaeology. Mm -hmm. And now here's what I think is really interesting about that. As historians, we're, we're all kind of working with the same stuff, right? Yeah. The same sources. Mm -hmm. The ORs, the National Tribune, Mollus, we're all working with the same material. right? And so you can interpret that material differently. You can, like Troy, look at it through a kind of a different lens or from a different angle. But barring some discovery of, you know, Joshua Chamberlain's, you know, uncensored, uh, you <laughs> know, recollections yeah, of the battle, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, the, the, the you know, last letter that Strong Vincent wrote that described his you know, role in the battle that we never knew about, barring some sort of discovery like that, I think we're about as far as written primary sources can take us. Yeah, I agree. Right? There's just yeah. not a whole lot that's going to add anything of tremendous value that's going to shift our interpretation. Especially with new general histories of the battle. Like, how many more of those can you write? 
we're all working from the same stuff. Yeah, we're yeah. All, like you know, again, maybe uh, the when Gary Gallagher edited the um, the E.P. Alexander mm-hmm. um, yep. book, I mean, that that added a lot. But you don't get there's not not a lot of that left, right? Right. There's just not a lot of that left. Right. I think archaeology though is something new, something that at this battlefield we've never used to learn about the past, right? Yeah. We do it for compliance. Well, we're going to lay this path down. We want to make sure we're not disturbing anything. But we've never looked at how archaeology can inform us about, about the battle. But that is a little bit of what Eric is doing with Little Round Top and with Devil's Den and uh, Caitlin Ball, who's an archaeological technician. So they're going to present some of their findings. So what do they find? What does it tell us about the battle? They're going to do it in such a way that it's you know protecting the, the archaeological record and the resources. Sure. But I think it's going to challenge a lot of our preconceptions about, I hope so. about Little Round Top. That would be great. I, you and I briefly spoke about uh, archaeology uh, when I saw you down at the Slider Farm. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And um, I, think, I think it would be awesome if um, – because remember I said, uh, have you seen that thing they did in a little bighorn years ago? Yeah, or, yeah. You yeah. Know, and it would be so cool if we could do something like that, we, if you guys could do something like that here. Um, and clearly, uh, you're doing that at Little Round Top, but but without having to do any kind of renovations, you know, just go to the field of Pickett's Charge, for example, and do some archaeology and see what you can find. Like, but but how realistic of a of a dream you know, is that? We treat the battlefield as if it is sacred ground, because it is. It is, and we yeah. don't want to disturb it if if we don't have to, right? right. So, I, you know, it comes off as treasure hunting, kind of. That's not what we do. Right. That's not what we do. Now, with Little Round Top, we have a legitimate reason to go in there and do archaeology, sure. right? So yeah. this, is a, this is a situation where archaeology aligns with our management goals, right? Yep. And with our park projects. And it, you know, ensures that we're not damaging that archaeological record. But at the same time, we can use that to learn about the past. We can yeah. learn about the battle. And so that's what Eric's going to present. I think it's going to be... Um, it's going to be one you don't want to miss. Awesome. Uh, Saturday, February 11th, 1st in 61, Nicholas Nick Biddle and Pennsylvania's Forgotten First Defenders by John Hoptak. Yeah, so uh, everybody knows uh, Ranger John Hoptak. He's taken over um, management of the park library. So if you do want to yes. get in there, make an appointment with him. Nick Biddle is an African-American, and he's one of the first volunteers to uh, to join up to support the cause of the union. Uh-huh. So John's going to delve into that story. That's cool. Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. If you're familiar with uh, with John John Hoptak, he's done a lot of research into the 48th Pennsylvania. Just, um, they yeah. you know, were involved with uh, Burnside and Antietam. They they dig the mine mm-hmm. at, at Petersburg. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Um, and and he loves uh, the African American history too. He's uh, done a he's done such tremendous and important work in helping us tell that story. Yeah, there. and so this is a, an extension of that. Yeah, cool. One, one of my favorite lectures was the one he did on the fifty fourth Massachusetts yeah. and handed out a name identities. with some imp- yeah identities yeah. to each one of us. And I think I, I want to say that there were hundred and eighteen he had to give away, and there were hundred and eighteen people in the audience, so it worked. So it worked out. Yeah. So I mean, we, it was the amount of people from the Adams County area who went and joined the fifty fourth Massachusetts. Yeah. I thought that was really neat. Uh, let's see. So Sunday, February 12th, the Super Bowl Sunday, no program. You How know, can you compete with the big game? <laughs> we learned our lesson. We learned our lesson. Uh, you stay home, <laughs> make your buffalo chicken yeah. fingers. <laughs> right. So you got a day off there. Yeah. Um, uh, but then the following weekend, February 18th, Saturday, Robert E. Lee, the antebellum years. That's going to be interesting with Matt Atkinson again. So you may recall from a few years back, so pre-COVID, uh, Matt did a program where he looked at Robert E. Lee in the post-war years. Mm-hmm. So what, what happens after Appomattox? What does Lee do? This is the prequel to that. So what is Robert E. Lee's life in those, those couple of decades leading up to the American Civil War? So Matt's going to look at Lee's relationship with slavery, his management of the Arlington estate, his experience out west, his, uh, the John Brown raid in Harper's Ferry. So... Um, again, the same level of energy and uh, excitement that one would expect from a Matt sure. Atkinson winter lecture. Well, and, and also that that's really interesting, too, to do uh, pre and post war, because most people that know anything about Lee really only know about the war. You know, like that's what we've really yeah. focused on. But there's, of course, more to the man than those four years. Well, the, in the 1840s and 50s, really, I think, in, in a very fundamental way, shape Lee, his mm-hmm. outlook on on. Uh, you know, his duty as a United States soldier, his, his, his kind of uh, 
his, his conception of loyalty. What does it mean to be loyal? Uh, and so Matt's going to delve into some of that. It's pretty, and then thinking last winter, you had Ty Sigley on to talk yeah. about Robert E. Lee and me. And he had, <laughs> I, we had him on a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, his, his take on Lee is not too, uh, what's the word, charitable. He's very critical yeah. of Lee, as, as yeah. you know, I think he has every right to be. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I, I trust that Matt is going to be just as objective. Yeah. So, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying Matt's going to praise him. I'm just, <laughs> I agree. Uh, so uh, Sunday, so February uh, 19th, placing the platform using 3D technology to pinpoint Lincoln at Gettysburg. Christopher Oakley, associate professor, UNC Asheville. So this is going to be interesting. Yeah. Go into this. So Christopher Oakley uh, most recently presented at the Lincoln Forum uh, just a couple weeks ago in November, pre-dedication pre, uh, day. He is um, he's a professor, as you mentioned, at, at UNC. He's a former Disney animator. And hmm. he uses, again, primary sources, so photographs, et cetera, taken on November 19th, 1863. He's combined that with GIS mapping. And Which is believes, what? What's GIS? So you look at... Um, you look at the topography of the landscape. Okay. You're using you're using mapping technologies that exist in the 21st century to answer questions about the 19th century. Interesting. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the technology because I will absolutely I will massacre <laughs> Butcher it. it. I will massacre it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, fortunately, he knows a lot about it though. Okay, and, good. Uh, at least he, one of you do. He's created a very compelling argument. Yeah. Very compelling argument, and this is going to be one of the first times that it's um, available for the general public. To, um, to, to, to kind of ponder. Has he published this anywhere? It has not been published. Like I said, he's presented it at the Lincoln Forum right. on November 19th on the front page of the New York Times. They oh. ran an article about his work. That's pretty cool. So there's much to debate. Uh, I think he presents a very, very compelling case for where the platform on November 19th was located, where Lincoln stood when he delivered the Gettysburg Address, and not to give it away. Uh-huh. But for many, many years, we've been saying, well, well, most likely it was in what is today Evergreen Cemetery. Right. Uh, Professor Oakley's uh, hypothesis is that it was actually in the Soldiers National Cemetery, which, if that were true, huh. would place Lincoln within the confines of what is today Gettysburg National Cemetery when he delivered the Gettysburg Address. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I got to make sure I get that one. And again, he will... He will go into his 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 reasoning, his technology that is used to to infer and can yeah. extrapolate some of this, but um, I, I think it's going to be very compelling. Cool. Uh, the twenty fifth of February, a Saturday, a crusade for peace: Eisenhower and the Korean War by Daniel Vermillier, Eisenhower National Historic Site. Dan has always well. First of all, I think most uh, Gettysburg uh, enthusiasts, your listeners, uh, are aware of Dan. Sure. Uh, longtime Gettysburg Ranger, he works at Eisenhower National Historic Site now. He's done a tremendous amount of work delving into Eisenhower and his relationship with the Korean conflict, which is it's the 70th anniversary. The uh, park recently accepted a uh, parka that Eisenhower wore when he visited Korea uh, as president elect. It's on display in the Museum and Visitor Center now. If you haven't seen it. Dan's going to go into the, the story of that. That's cool. Yeah, okay. Cool. Nice. And then the next day, Sunday, February 26th, Gettysburg and the Civil War from county seat to national symbol, Barb Sanders, Gettysburg National Military Park. This sounds like this will be interesting, too. Yeah. So they're you know, all Barb, interesting. Barb's going to look at, you know, how does Gettysburg develop into this national shrine and icon? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think Gettysburg is still sometimes referred to as the, you know, the, what is it, the most famous small town in America? Yes. Yes. Barb's going to delve into that. Good. How was that crafted? How did that, how did that come to be? Why does Gettysburg have such a, a, a aura a draw? It's funny. I was talking earlier today to a friend of mine who has a t-shirt business and he wants to eventually open a brick and mortar store. And he said, uh, you know, his, his goal, his dream is to open it here. Mm-hmm. Um, and he goes, but you know, there's also some pretty good space, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, Philly, like in the old town area and, uh, you know, some thinking there too. And I said, yeah, I mean, you know, I said, you got to go to, you got to do Gettysburg for, I mean, this is the capital. This is the history capital of America, if not the world. Like, you know, there's World War II history here. There's so much history here. Um, And even if there, you know, I remember one time I was, (laughs) I was, uh, I was sitting out on Steinware Avenue with a friend of mine and we were just observing people. And I think it was Memorial Day weekend. And, you know, there's all types of reenactors in town and everything. And, uh. We, I swear to God, we saw uh, like uh, like Wild Bill Hickok, you know, it had nothing to do with here. 
or or uh, Vietnam. There were like Vietnam yeah. reenactors, you know, now Memorial Day weekend, you know, it makes sense. But like everybody and anybody, whatever you want to dress as, you can walk around here and no one's going to bat an eye. You know, I, I, I've witnessed that same phenomenon. I saw, I saw what I presume to be an Athenian hoplite uh, <laughs> straight out of the Peloponnesian War. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, you could wear a full <laughs> suit of armor in this in this place, and no one would care. They'd seat you at a restaurant and wouldn't wouldn't say a word. You know, it's just the way it is here. It's a cool. It's I think a, for Americans, Gettysburg is synonymous with history, right? Yeah. So it's just this is collectively the place we've decided to to remember the American yeah. Civil War, and I think by by default or by association, the history. Oh, that, that certainly helps that we have this World War II history here. Sure, sure. A you know, very vibrant um, local history. But yeah, you, Gettysburg's something special. It, it, it's something, something special, special, all right. And then if uh, if any of those uh, days are snowed out, um, Saturday, March 4th, Correct. and Sunday, March 5th are the rain dates. And uh, invariably, that, that happens every year, so we try to build in for that contingency. That's pretty smart. Uh, how about some other interpretive things coming on uh, this winter? So I would be... Um I would be remiss not to mention the programming that we have for, for children, for families, for young visitors. So we have an education team that just does absolutely fantastic work. Every Saturday at 11 a.m. from January 7th through February 25th, we have our, our History Kids Reading Adventures Club, where our education team, they pick a children's book and they read it to, um, to the, the folks that show up and they delve into the history. So 11 a.m., free of charge, every Saturday. Uh, January 7th through February 25th. And so that leads right into the lecture, basically. Right. Yep. So right you can you can bring your kid to that and then make your kids sit through the lecture. It's perfect. <laughs> it per- works out perfect. And Barb perfect. Sanders still does that? Uh, Barb and John Hopton. And yep. John. That's yep. right. Okay. Um, and then uh, tell me about February 4th. This is cool. So we've never done this before. This is the first time we're publicly talking about it. But on February 4th, thanks in large part to um, to the support that we get from the Gettysburg Foundation, we're taking the Museum and Visitor Center, and we're opening it up for free between 9 and 11 a.m. And what we're doing is we're turning all of the sound off, and we're turning the lights up. So if you want to go and see the, the Cyclorama painting and just have time with the painting, you can do it. If you want to go into the galleries, the museum galleries, which is it's loud in there. Yeah. There's sound bleed yeah. everywhere. It's tough to just be quiet and reflective. Mm-hmm. Well, on February 4th, between 9 and 11, free of charge, you can go explore the galleries. We're going to have hands-on history carts with, with tactiles that you can feel throughout the building. And this is really going to be an opportunity for families with, with individuals that are on the autism spectrum or have sensory needs to have a quiet morning in the Museum and Visitor Center and no charge. PTSD, you mentioned We before. have a lot of veterans who come yeah. to the park who want to engage with the history, but especially that cyclorama program, yeah. the, the immersive 3D sound. Yeah. It's um it it can be it can be problematic it can be triggering sure and so we're turning that all off yeah. so you can go and again have a quiet reflective morning at the museum and visitor center free of charge we talked um, again at the slider farm about like out of the box things that you guys could do this is one of those I think it's, it's a you know especially the tactile stuff yeah. like people uh, I think it, to me uh, the study of history needs to have an element of experience whenever possible like you know reading or listening to podcasts or watching YouTube videos it's good and you can certainly learn from that but to me at least if I can touch something it does something in my brain that makes me it, it just makes everything yeah. click you know well, what I, I mean? You know, I think people, when they, when they go to a place like Gettysburg or any historic site, what they're looking to do at a, at a fundamental level, they're looking to connect with something that's real. Yeah. Right? That's authentic. Yeah. That, that, you know, you can touch. Yeah. Right? And it, it might be the hike you take on the battlefield. It might be the, the artifact in the museum that you can see. And this program is, is kind of an extension of that, but aimed at a, at a very kind of specific audience for people that are looking for that more toned down experience. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we didn't invent this idea. We copied it from Mount Vernon, from the National Museum of Scotland. The Smithsonian does something similar. And it's an opportunity for us to be a bit more inclusive with our visitors. Yeah. Uh, to offer, a, you know, a more welcoming environment for those folks that are, you know, of that ilk. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, we've never done it before, so it's a pilot. It's but a great idea. I'm excited about it. Yeah. And the... Uh, uh, no, oh, I lost what I was going to say. Okay, but you said enough. Uh, <laughs> is anything else? Anything else going well, on? Well, you know, I'll say we have so many park projects going on, from the Little Round Top Rehab to to a host of other things. So it's a great time to be to be visiting Gettysburg. It's a great time to be interested in the American Civil War. 
It is. It is. Absolutely. So, uh, folks, I hope you uh, come out to the lectures. I'll be at all of them, or Veronica will be there. Somebody from Addressing Gaysburg will be there um, with the recorder. Uh, and uh, stop and say hi if you see us there. Uh, otherwise, that's about it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Matt. And we'll talk to you guys next time. All righty. So let me just uh, do this here. See, it's tough without Eric. I don't have Eric. You do it all by yourself. I got to do it all by myself. <laughs> Our hearts so stout have got a stain for soon to spill from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's followed, drink down and pay.